Today we will have uh, two discussions uh, to Professor Assad's talk. The first discussant is uh, Dr. Yahya Seremba. Uh, Dr. Seremba is uh, a research fellow at MISER, our youngest research fellow uh, who got his uh, PhD at MISER last year. And our second discussant is Professor Gil Anijar, who spoke uh, last week uh, and has been kind enough to agree to come back today as a discussant. Uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, Professor Assad, who in spite of multiple responsibilities has been generous enough to agree to give this talk. Uh, the talk is not going to be, uh, the session will not be three hours, which is what it normally is, but it'll be two hours. Uh, which is what it normally is in most parts around the world. So we should be, we should be fine with it. Uh, Professor Assad is best known for his two books, Genealogies of Religion and the Formations of the Secular. Um, he's, a, he's an anthropologist, he's a philosopher uh, of uh, life, if I might say, after reading his piece on Wittgenstein, uh, end, of, end of Religion. Um, and uh, it is our huge pleasure to have him. I don't want to take any more time. Uh, Professor Assad. Well, thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I want actually to uh, say uh, very few things because as I explained to my dear friend um, Professor Mahmoud Mablani yesterday when he told me that there would be uh, a talk of about an hour and um, then various respondents and so on um, and I said that I had the impression that since I had circulated the paper uh, in advance uh, that it was, wasn't necessary for me to um, go through it again. But particularly because I want to stress uh, a couple of points in regard to the paper, um, like a number of things that uh, I've written recently which have in their title uh, the word thinking about something this piece is, um, like those, literally an attempt to think through writing. In other words, it is not intended, uh, and I never saw it originally, as the presentation of a particular thesis with the appropriate uh, evidence or arguments for it, uh, and then a final conclusion which hopefully uh, would convince you all uh, that I made sense. On the contrary, uh, it was for me to begin with something which is a, a way of trying to uh, think through certain ideas uh, in various directions. And that's something that I also uh, have, I think, acquired uh, from rightly or wrongly, as one of the most uh, helpful uh, and uh, important uh, lessons from uh, reading Wittgenstein over the years. That is to say, uh, to think about something without always being absolutely certain as to what the conclusion will be. And, and incidentally, I should say that his most famous work uh, philosophical investigations uh, really is technically speaking something like the explorations, uh, philosophical explorations uh, that is like any very um, uh, original uh, exploration of an environment. It is an intended, it is intended to, to look for something and not always 
be certain what it is one will find uh, as one proceeds in one's writing. Now this means, among other things, that it's very difficult, if not impossible, uh, to summarize uh, the, the paper, uh, since the paper is not something which is, for various reasons that I've tried to mention, summarizable. Uh, it contains various uh, ideas which are connected, which lead me to think that they are connected, uh, with regard to what is broadly uh, perhaps the domain of religion uh, and of secularism, which is in many ways it's, it's, uh, it's uh, sort of twinned, as I have said on some occasions. So that's, that's one point. And the other point uh, is a more personal one, and that is that really for uh, many, many decades now, uh, I have when I've written something and it's finished and it goes off, this particular paper will appear uh, in critical times uh, in September, uh, I believe, uh, together with a number of uh, respondents who will have things to say about parts of it. Um, whenever I've written something which has finally gone to press, I find it very difficult, if not impossible, to reread and, and find it rather distasteful even, uh, and therefore I don't do it. On this occasion, I make an exception because of my dear friend, uh, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, and as I say, I had hoped that, that simply circulating this paper, since it's coming out anyway, uh, would be sufficient to stimulate some kind of discussion uh, on things that we might agree on or disagree on, or which we might have further ideas that are, that are interesting and important that uh, certainly had not uh, occurred to me. Uh, and this is why I also agreed, not only as a favor uh, to an old friend, uh, but also in the hopes that one will get something from the way in which people ask questions, the way in which people uh, respond uh, to some of the things that I've said. So um, uh, I assume that most of you have read it. I will simply go uh, through um, one or two major, in a, one or two major ways, uh, what the the, um, the the paper covers. Uh, to begin with, it's it's an attempt to restate what I found most useful in reading. Wittgenstein, which I've done since really, since I was first introduced by a very old English friend of mine in 1954, which is just about a year or so uh, after, a year or two after it was uh, um, published. Uh, and I've, off and on I have been reading it and then putting it aside and, and so on, but particularly over the last couple of, of decades, uh, two or three decades, I have found it more and more uh, relevant to the kinds of things that that interest me uh, in in the question of of religion. So the first part is really just about that. It's about um, what I think is really significant uh, about the way in which Wittgenstein, particularly in his later work, has uh, tried to uh, indicate the connection uh, between uh, language and life uh, and the the uh, the the the, um, the unsystematic character uh, of the way in which language expresses things the way in which it does things the way in which it presupposes uh, various kinds of learning uh, various kinds of relearning uh, and and so on so that, that's roughly the first part. The second part is <clears throat> the, the thing that also is connected both with those ideas and with anyone interested in nowadays in the question of religion uh, and of secularity. And this has to do with the question of, of persuasion or what I call persuadability. Uh, that is, what is it uh, of course, according to certain 
rather rigid doctrines. Uh, not all secularists either have this, are committed to this, but certainly uh, some of them are, many of them are, uh, uh, namely that, that religion uh, requires you to suspend uh, all reason, all rationality, uh, and to, um, uh, to be obedient simply to an external authority. And I think that many people recognize that this is not, uh, this is not really a helpful way uh, of thinking about the whole question. So I talk a little bit about, about what it is that makes things persuadable. Um, and there I should add something that tends sometimes to be forgotten, that what is persuasive, uh, and what seems reasonable, is not only connected with our way of life, uh, as Wittgenstein stressed again and again and elaborated again and again, but also that there are kinds of things that one perhaps uh, more easily is persuadable by and some much more difficultly. And there perhaps one of the things that one could, one could uh, think about, speculate about, is what are the conditions that make some things ordinarily, if you see somebody who's obviously going to a meeting, a large meeting somewhere, uh, and uh, by, the, by the dress they have and, and other things that they were mentioning, uh, and they're going in the wrong direction, and you can say, a trivial example, look, uh, you're going in the wrong direction if that's what you want, the meeting. Uh, and they will more or less uh, accept that and turn around and go, in the direction you pointed out. A fairly trivial example, but an ordinary one, uh, which in a sense doesn't require any great reorientation in one's way of life. But there are other things, of course, which require uh, or which seem to presuppose that you can be persuaded to shift fundamentally not only your opinions, but also the kind of life that the opinions are rooted in. So that's uh, something that I would like to, to stress again. Um, the final part has, as, I, as it's called also, uh, that's the one before that uh, really, is an attempt to look at two uh, great Islamic traditions that have been written about uh, in histories of Islamic thought, uh, who have been described respectively as traditionalists, and um, as rationalists. Rationalists are people who uh, have been concerned to look at certain apparent contradictions uh, in, in Islamic thought and practice and in Islamic uh, scripture as well, and uh, to explain what the proper answer to these contradictions are. In other words, as I've said in, in, in the paper too, they see contradictions as, a, as an intellectual scandal and are concerned to, to do something about that. Uh, and traditionalists, this is of course the, you might say, uh, a traditional uh, representation also of these two sides, which I see by the way as not necessarily absolutely fixed, uh, but as something which one can see in the way in which descriptions in the history of, of Islamic thought uh, uh, represent them, uh, which are not always, as I said, uh, fixed. So I try to uh, look at some of those, but particularly at one of the most important of the so-called traditionalists, um, whom I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, the, the great medieval Islamic theologian and jurist uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, who was born and uh, who, was, who, who came from Damascus in particular. Um, the final part then is really uh, some concluding thoughts uh, on the basis of uh, what I have uh, tried to think about in the, in the previous two, uh, previous three sections. And they include a concern with the way in which uh, language as well as ways of life shift uh, and shift and make possible different kinds of, of senses. Uh, and it's in that context uh, 
uh, as I point out, that even the meaning of what is or isn't religion, what is or isn't uh, secularism uh, becomes significant. And I have a short little piece on something that many people have written about, uh, and that is of, of uh, uh, the way in which secularism emerged, particularly in the history of, of uh, Christianity uh, and of Europe, as a way of resolving uh, what was seen uh, in the 16th uh, century, particularly 15, uh, 16th, 17th centuries, uh, as a, a great source of violence uh, and intolerance. Many people have, have, have written about that. And of course, we have, we have thinkers of that time who were concerned not only with religious tolerance, but also showing how and why it has to be connected with what we now, looking back, see as the early formation of the modern state, uh, together with the powers of the modern state. So I don't say too much about that. Uh, but one of the things that, in this particular paper, but, but one of the things that, that concerns me and has concerned me uh, for some time. Uh, and also the way in which uh, calculation uh, and, uh, as it were, the use of, of statistics and mathematics most broadly has been central to the development of both the natural sciences, uh, and of uh, political power uh, and the power of, of certain segments of society. So that's really, that, that sort of ragbag towards the end is uh, what concluding thoughts are about. So I'm going to end here um, in the hopes that, that the people who have responses will be able to say something um, really uh, unnerving and, and uh, disruptive to some of the things that, that I thought about when I was uh, writing that paper. But I don't really enjoy going over that, uh, that paper, as I said, uh, since it's finished. And like any detritus, one feels that it's, it's got to be set aside now and one has to go on to other things. So, Mahmoud, uh, I'm sorry it wasn't a full lecture and a full, full talk but I, I'm not sure that I could make uh, a repetition of uh, some of the things that I said for that lecture. So I'm going to end here, and I hope we will have a, a wider discussion. Sure. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Talal. Um, you are quite right that uh, it makes no sense to be repetitious, uh, to write something as a paper, uh, and then to talk it. Um, as if nobody had read it. Uh, and actually the usual miser seminar is that uh, people are expected to read the paper and uh, they come expecting no more than 15 minutes of introductory remarks from the speaker. Uh, and the onus is on the discussants to then frame a discussion. And the discussion that follows is an opportunity to provoke the speaker, to flesh out uh, different aspects of uh, ideas contained in the paper. Uh, and what we get and what we do not get is really a product of the discussion and the discussions. So thank you very much. Um, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Yahya Seremba. Yahya. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Amdani, for the opportunity. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, a sort of echo, but yes, more or less. Please, oh, go right. ahead. Um, thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, the work of Talal Assad. I consider this a great opportunity uh, because there is no question that he's an exceptional um, scholar of our time. I don't consider myself to be competent enough to discuss Talal Assad, especially in this field in which I'm not an expert. Nevertheless, I consider it a great um, opportunity. So, uh, f first of all, um, the paper comes at a very uh, good time 
time when traditionalism seems to be seems to be uh, the dominant understanding of Islam among many Muslims, especially traditionalism in the Salafi version of it. Your choice of Ibn Taymiyyah is also excellent uh, because he's a major inspiration, a very major inspiration to, to, to Salafism and to traditionalism in Islam in general. So my first question is, what would be the limitation of understanding traditionalism in Islam through the eyes of a modern Western philosopher? A philosopher, so there, 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 there are three, four things about this philosopher. One, he's modern, two, he's Western, three, his exposure to religion could be to, to, to Christianity. And he doesn't claim any pretense to the knowledge of Islam. So we can, we can, we, we, we can be excused to think that his philosophizing is based on his familiarity, his knowledge of, of, of Christianity. And, and and not Islam. So what it does, seeing traditionalism through the eyes of this Western philosopher, what does it allow you to see about traditionalism and what does it prevent you from seeing? What does it obscure? And I would like to, to look at the way in which traditionalism has been portrayed in your paper. So um, you seem to suggest that uh, the traditionalist has no conception of contradiction in the Quran, in Islam, etc. So the Quran is clear. So everything in it is clear and there is no need for, for, for interpretation. There's no need for talking about its, its meaning. So let me quote a section from your paper. Since the Quran verse is ex expressed in the best and on, sorry, let me repeat. Since the Quranic verse is expressed in the best and the only way possible, as all, all faithful Muslims believe, there can be no distinction between alternative meanings and so no reason for the exegete to invent metaphorical meanings in place of literal ones. So your representation of traditionalism is that uh, it does not acknowledge any existence of metaphorical verses or metaphorical ideas in the Quran and in Islam in general. Uh, because as the Quran says in different places, and as you quote in your text, the Quran is Kitab al mubin a clear text, a clear book. So I would like to invite your attention to, to instances where the traditionalist also acknowledges contradiction and metaphorical and clear and confusing confusing verses in the Quran and in Islamic teachings all, all together. So there is this verse that all traditionalists recite everywhere. So I'll cite one verse and, and, and one hadith. So the verse is in, is in Surat Al-Imran, Al -Imran, that is chapter three, verse seven. And the, uh, the, 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 the verse says somewhere that uh, in the Quran, minhu ayatu muhtamatu. The Quran has clear verses. That's how it's commonly translated. Blah, blah, blah. And then, wa ukhar mutashabihat. Wa ukhar mutashabihat. Some other verses in the Quran are not clear, are metaphorical. 
are confusing. So the traditionalists, every day, I've had them every day recite, uh, recite this verse, and they acknowledge the existence of metaphorical, confusing, and clear verses in the Quran. So there is also this hadith that, uh, that every Muslim who has been brought up in a religious family has, has memorized. I memorized it at, at, at a, very, a very early age, which you must be familiar with. And it says, al halalu bayin wal haramu bayin. The lawful is, is, is clear and the unlawful is clear. Wabaynahuma umuru mutashabihat. But between the lawful and the unlawful are confusing issues. Uh, uh, metaphorical and clear and clear issues. So uh, that 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 seems to contradict um, your representation of the traditionalist as as people who see only coherence, who only see clarity in the Quran. So how do they behave? How do they act? Respond in the face of of such unclarity, such absence of clarity. In, 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 when, when the Quran itself says that it is not clear, its, its sections are not, are not clear. How does the, the traditionalist respond in, in, in that kind of, of, of situation? I, I think you were not able to ask this question because the philosopher through which you have decided to look at fundamentalism, look at um, traditionalism, does not allow you to um, does not allow you to, to 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 ask it. So I would be I would be extremely uh, um, appreciative to see uh, to see how um, how you respond uh, to cases in which ambiguity in which the Quran uh, says to be ambiguous in in, in certain. Well, I don't have much to say. I'll leave the um, world to, to Jean Anija, which, which must, who, who must be familiar much more. Anija will, of course. Uh, are you yeah, still talking? You want me, to, want me to wait until um, everybody uh, else? Talal, Talal, you decide. If you want to speak right now, please feel free to go ahead. Or if you want to speak after Anija uh, has also given his uh, discussion to respond to both, you can do that. Yeah. Well, I will say something very quickly uh, and then we can uh, elaborate yeah. uh, on that later on. First of all, um, yeah, yeah, I, I would like to disclaim any authority uh, that I speak for either the so-called traditionalists uh, or the uh, uh, rationalists. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not uh, uh, claiming that kind of authority, but I have a position. Uh, and as I've tried to say uh, in various places, which is not only to be found in, in this paper, but in other things as well, that it's much more difficult than people believe, especially in the kind of, of domain uh, of problems and and answers and so on that we are dealing with uh, to maintain strictly the dis difference between inside and outside. Uh, inside a tradition or outside a tradition is often very difficult, even though we try sometimes and we think it's important uh, to make that distinction. The other thing I would say, um, that's, that's one point, and I think it's very important, certainly is important for me, um, and problematizes the old corny business of, um, uh, you, you know, what is uh, the problem of incommensurability uh, and relativism and so on, as if everybody knew exactly what, what was wrong with relativism uh, and incommensurability uh, and what the answer to that was. It's, it's much more complicated uh, than that, and I tried to uh, gesture to it. So that um, being inside uh, and reacting uh, 
to certain ideas is also paradoxically something that one is doing when one is kind of quasi philosophizing. Uh, although, you know, taking a, uh, and I'm neither a traditionalist nor a, in that sense, uh, nor a rationalist, uh, but try to show uh, and to emphasize the different kinds of role that uh, reasoning takes in both. And that, that's for me the most important thing. Uh, and uh, the fact that it is possible not only to use a Western philosopher when one is philosophizing, but even other kinds of traditions. Uh, and it's always been my, my thought that um, the notion of traditions being tightly wound together uh, and uh, being having an inside and an outside is, is the thing that is problematic and part of the difficulty when we start talking about what is um, you know, incommensurable, uh, what, is an uh, what is relativism, what isn't relativism, and so on. These are, these are and Wittgenstein tries to, to problematize that in different ways. And I think that there has been a continuous, as many historians have, have known, but not always moved in the right direction consequently, there's been a continuous uh, interaction, uh, discussion, argument, sometimes, as I say, opportunistic, sometimes hostile, sometimes not, sometimes open-minded, between the different traditions that exist in, uh, the, at least in the Middle East, as well as in other parts of the world too, at different times historically. So I would, I would, I want to problematize the notion that there is always a clear cut, you know, what is a position, what is the Salafi, by the way, I'm, I'm a little worried about the notion of a Salafi, uh, which is prevalent nowadays, um, and certainly do not intend to speak for them, uh, and, and or for, for the other rationalist side either, for that matter. Um, but I want us to think uh, more problematically about that and also to, uh, to remember that when the whole question of Mutashabi had uh, appears in the Quran, it is precisely something that doesn't have a clear meaning and therefore, incidentally, you cannot establish uh, certain clear-cut uh, Sharia rules on the basis of Mutashabi had. Uh, but on the cases of, of, of uh, ahkam, you know, what is, what, is, what is clear, hukum and so on, you can. Uh, but there are, clearly, there are things in the Quran. Um, and of course, the, the view of many so-called uh, uh, traditionalists is st uh, stop um, philosophical speculating about what it might mean, because they are fearful that, that as a consequence of that, you might end up by attributing certain meanings which are contrary to uh, a, a, a conception of Islam or, or the, of the tradition or a particular question and so on. Mutashabihat, al mutashabihat, and of course, the, among other things, the, the famous, you know, letters, Alif Lam Mim or whatever it may be, the beginning of various surahs are themselves the subject of considerable speculation. But, um, the, 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 the contrary argument is there's no point in this speculation um, if there's a danger, in fact, of the speculation becoming the basis of new doctrines, then uh, it is not only no point in it, but it's worse than having no point in it. Just leave it be. It's something that we don't understand at the moment. So that's, that's the usual uh, argument there. I'm not sure, Yahya, that, that I have uh, re re reacted to, to uh, all your interesting points, because there's a lot more to be said, I'm sure, and you will say it too, and other people. But um, yes, I, I, I'm aware that so-called traditionalists also recognize mutashabihat, um, that is to things which are not clear. Uh, uh, but that doesn't make for contradictions, by the way. It makes for a totally different category. Uh, the category of mutashabihat are not the same as the category of uh, what is regarded as contradictory. Uh, and it has, of course, various responses which people um, uh, do, do in practice make. 
but it's the practice which is of course indeed stressed by the so-called um, traditionalists as opposed to the speculation which is necessary we are doing it i'm doing it in the paper uh you know and anybody who does that uh is bound to encounter a certain uh kind of of paradox and contradiction but that's not new you know we we have to to some extent engage with that fact rather than say ah shown that you were yourself uh, contradictory because contradiction doesn't necessarily mean uh you know a, a disaster uh, it may in fact provoke one to uh, something much more interesting and the same with something which sounds absurd uh, leave Musa Shrabihat aside for the moment because they are simply obscure uh, what are contradictions what are absurdities uh, are not necessarily proof that this is absurd that this is wrong uh, you know, a very narrow-minded kind of uh, rationalism would would insist uh, on that, and we know that this is not what what actually happens. Anyway, I'll I'll stop there for the moment, uh, Yahya. But thank you very much for that, and uh, look forward to what uh, Gil has to say. Go ahead, Gil. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. Mahmoud for including me uh, once again. I'm, I'm happy to be back after a shorter um, length of time than last time. Uh, um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, uh, engage uh, Talal in conversation. I, um, I want to start by saying that um, even though Talal uh, made a point of saying that the paper has uh, uh, distinct moments that may or may not be summarizable, one of the threads that I um, think um, the paper uh, does provide is, uh, is something that Talal shares with, um, with Wittgenstein, namely um, that it puts forward a notion of learning, right? Learning to be distinguished from teaching is um, is something that actually uh, uh, would work as a kind of not so much theme but uh, um, but a constant uh, object of reflection um, through the the three parts of the paper. Um, so the the first part, as Talal himself described it, um, is actually about what he has learned, what what Talal himself has learned from Wittgenstein. The second part is about persuasion, but more importantly, about persuadability, which actually suggests um, something as to what it might mean to be persuaded. In other words, to be put in the position whereby receiving new knowledge, new uh, experiences, one would be able to learn, presumably to change, but again, to learn, one is not only confronted with a teacher, yes, but, uh, um, but nonetheless, one is called upon to learn, to be persuaded, to change uh, one's uh, ways. And then the last part about the, the debate between the traditionalist and the rationalist would be actually about different ways in which one learns to read. The way one reads, the way one learns from the Quran. Right? What does it mean to actually receive the word and, and, um, and learn it? What, what is one called upon to do as one learns? Um, and um, the, um, the notion that uh, Talal presented of not wanting himself to actually revisit and reread uh, his own paper seems to me to speak very much to the sense that as one learns, as one thinks through, as Talal said, as one thinks through um, a series of um, problems, um, one may discover that the path that one has traversed is only that, a, a path, a series of steps that one has taken and that need not be revisited insofar as one learned, but one has learned as the, and therefore moved elsewhere. And, uh, and the papers and many of Talal's papers, uh, much of Talal's writing, are, um, uh, although I do think that they need to be reread, but I do think that there's, some, there's a dimension of what it means to learn that 
must take into consideration the possibility of taking one's distance from that which one has learned, right? Moving away, moving to a different um, path, as it were. Um, and the whole notion of persuadability seems to me central uh, to that. Now, of course, as a practitioner of learning, um, Talal shares much with Wittgenstein from whom he has learned for many, many decades. Um, and, and I think that one of the things that one sees in Wittgenstein, and I see that Anat Matar is with us, so I hesitate to uh, present myself as any kind of expert on Wittgenstein, which I am not. I have actually started uh, reading Wittgenstein seriously only with Talal a few, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm very grateful for that learning experience. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, that Wittgenstein does in his writing is constantly invoke moments of learning. Uh, often with children, a child learning, but also very much with adults. And, um, and one of the things that reading Wittgenstein and reading Talal uh, makes me think about much is, um, is the notion that learning is something that happens only in some moment in life, say in childhood, uh, or as one trains. Um, and more importantly, in some institutions, institution of learning, institutions of higher learning. And Mahmoud uh, knows that I'm, uh, I've been very curious about the organization of knowledge, the institutions of knowledge, um, and the way in which different knowledges are distributed um, and, and what that does to learning. And I'm thinking here of Ivan Illich, who actually makes the argument that schools, right, schools and universities are actually destroying knowledge because just like um, medicine, um, modern medicine, which localizes the knowledge of medicine among, uh, among experts and institutions like hospitals, uh, what that does is actually subcontract a knowledge that should be uh, inherent to who we are and, and um, exteriorizes it in an institution, in a, in a person, that, uh, uh, that presumably knows for us, right? So you have a pain, you go to the doctor and you say, doctor, can you explain to me what my body is telling me? Rather than actually experience one's own body as a source of knowledge that presumably one has, yes? So that subcontracting of, uh, of knowledge is one of the things that I think may be, um, if not undone, interrogated by a, a, a separation, which I, I read very much both in Wittgenstein and in Talal's work, a separation between teaching, yes, I am the professor, I teach, rather than uh, I am a permanent student and I learn. And the, the posture that Talal occupies and, and makes us occupy is that we are learners. We are all constant learners. And, and the implications of these are, um, it seemed to me, uh, uh, very important. Um, I don't want to revisit some of the conversation we had last week about translation, but, um, but I do want to signal that the question of translation, and to say it very quickly, the, the, the question of translating and the uh, extraordinary uh, obviousness of, uh, um, of, a, of translation, of the translation that takes place when we say religion, and we already know which tradition belongs to that particular category, right? So Christianity is a religion and Islam is a religion, right? As Yahya was actually uh, beginning his remarks with that sense that Wittgenstein knows Christianity, doesn't know Islam, right? He knows religion, he doesn't know uh, that other religion. And, and, and I want to ask whether learning doesn't mean in this particular case, uh, learning to translate otherwise. Um, the importance of putting forward the question of learning is that it also, and this is where persuadability enters, is that the reference to Freud, which is uh, quite quick in the paper, uh, as it is fairly quick in Wittgenstein, who talks about Freud, but not at you know, massive length, is that one of the things that Freud has made us aware of is the fact that sometimes we do not want to know, right? Um, so Talal is asking, in what context 
in what, uh, under what conditions can one learn, can one be persuaded, and if one pays attention to one's form of life, what it means to actually change one's mind if one's life is, um, is actually uh, occupied by a particular kind of knowledge, right? So for example, uh, and this is something Talal and I have been uh, talking, Talal marvels at the fact that we are constantly told to recycle uh, plastic bags, but plastic bags are of course everywhere. Uh, um, we are actually bombarded with plastic, right? Um, and yet we are told to change the way we think about plastic and stop using it, right? So we would learn to recycle. But the problem, of course, is that you know, we, we must learn to recycle as we continue to be bombarded with artifacts, bags and otherwise, of plastic. So the learning is literally impossible, right? I mean, sure, we may recycle here and there, but the plastic that continues to, uh, uh, to bombard us is a form of life, as it were, that makes it impossible for us to learn to not use plastic, right? We cannot refrain. Uh, we cannot stop the flow of plastic. We can only manage it with recycling. So the, the, the possibility of learning is contingent on the form of life. Yes, that would be one of the major points of the paper. Um, but, um, but we also need to take into consideration unwillingness to learn, right? Uh, and not necessarily willful, uh, but simply um, the lack of desire to learn the resistance to learning, uh, resistance being, of course, a psychoanalytic uh, term. Now, um, as he explores uh, the different forms of life that he invokes in the paper, Talal um, calls attention to, uh, uh, to something that concerns us all, namely, what form of life is the scholarly or the scientific life? Presumably, it's the life of the mind, yes, to invoke the phrase of Hannah Arendt, the life of the mind. But what uh, what Talal reminds us of is the fact that we, as, as much as we are invested in our mind and in learning uh, in some kind of abstract manner, we are occupying a certain form of life. And now the, the question would be, is there a scientific form of life, right? Is one a scientist, for example, um, in the laboratory, but also outside of the laboratory? Um, is one constantly a scientist? Are we scholars from morning to evening and night, or are we scholars only at certain moment? And so uh, the question, uh, what do we learn? Where do we learn? Yes, the institution. Um, and, and how we learn um, becomes uh, altered, right? We actually need to learn that the way we learn is not only a question of what, what we learn, not only a question of where, where we learn, and not only a question of how we learn, but actually the fact that um, as we learn, we are doing all kinds of things. We are actually living, yes? Um, and, and the learning is part of that, um, uh, if, of that form of life. And so the question of learning should become, what form of life do we embrace? And what are the possibilities for that form of life to change? And learning becomes not just what information or what even practice of knowledge do I learn, but how does it fit? How can it fit? Can it fit into a form of life that I uh, occupy? Um, so how do we live as scholars, right? Uh, and whether we are traditionalist or rationalist, we are kinds of scholars, right? We are readers uh, to, to, to jump ahead to the paper. Um, now, of course, essential to the form of life we occupy is the language that we speak, the language that we use, the concepts and the lexicon that we deploy, um, but also the grammar, right? Uh, uh, a, a very important Wittgensteinian term, uh, which raises the question that Talal uh, uh, articulates, namely, how does language articulate itself with what we study, but also with the life that we uh, live? So those of us who speak English as a pseudo-native uh, language um, are of, have, of course, no problem understanding the words that we speak. We speak them. So we say religion, and we have an understanding of religion. And we have an understanding of what uh, reference we can make uh, within that context. We say religion. Some of us might say capitalism, but most of us would think, first of all, 
again, of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, etc. Um, the religion of economy might be something that uh, stretches our understanding of religion, right? Um, so how do we, how does our language articulate itself? Uh, and I refer you here to, uh, to what Talal has written on cultural translation and the way in which as he translates the native's um, um, form of life, Ernst Gellner, of course, addresses a very different audience, the scholarly audience, and as he does that, the translation uh, is, in fact, into his own language, into the language of his audience, the scholarly language. And what happens in that, uh, in that translation, right? Something that we can take for granted, because what other language could we speak except for the one we speak? But then what happens uh, uh, to our learning, presumably from others? And grammar in Wittgenstein and in the way Talal deploys it um, is more than the way in which language is articulated with itself, the way in which concepts function in a certain syntax with other words, etc. But also, in fact, the way language is articulated with a form of life, right? And the word grammar would have to actually be expanded to include articulation between language and other realms of our uh, existence. And so um, I, I, I think that one way to, um, to summarize this would be to say, what, um, what are we already persuaded by as a result of the life we live? Right? What are we already persuaded by? And so to be persuaded otherwise to learn might actually require to unpersuade ourselves from the life and the, therefore the persuasion that we can take for granted, right? So what change, not just of mind, right? It's not only about changing our mind, but rather what changes of disposition, right? What behavioral transformation are necessary in order to actually learn, right? To actually learn something um, from which we can be persuaded, right? And uh, again, uh, the example of the plastic bag and recycling has to do with the fact that, yes, we can uh, recycle, we can change some of our disposition, but one thing we cannot do is live in a, in a world that doesn't bombard us with plastic, right? Where the plastic industry doesn't continue to generate the plastic that occupies all of our existence, right? Um, so we might be persuaded cognitively, we might change a few gestures and make sure that we put the recycling in the right bin, but we do not, um, uh, we, we are not persuaded out of our form of life, which is plastic based. I'm only slightly exaggerating. So then um, if, if we take this seriously, the question to me, and that's the question that I, I, I feel I've been asking Talal uh, repeatedly, um, and, and I don't know that there's a satisfactory answer, but I would like uh, uh, to, to raise it, is what, we, what does it mean to qualify a form of life? In other, in other words, to put an adjective, just as I have been doing, is there a scientific form of life, as opposed to a form of life where science is part of life, is part of the life we know, right? And in this, uh, in this particular uh, period, um, where science is in fact a requirement, an imperative to embrace a certain form of life, yes, to put on a mask, right, to social distance, um, to listen to the doctors, right? Science is um, a form of life. And what, what it means um, to um, occupy a form of life that would actually resist science at this point is borderline offensive, right? And yet we are talking about persuadability. What if I do not trust the medical discourse? What if I take the authority uh, of, of um, a, a, a source of authority for my life that is not a doctor, that is not a physician, right? What happens then? Am I persuadable uh, or am I uh, abjected? Am I uh, offensive. Um, but if whichever, uh, um, whichever we, uh, 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 we decide on this, um, there is a question of whether we can fully separate our medical form of life from our form of life, um, our scientific form of life from 
uh, uh, from a non-scientific form of life. And I'm not saying, of course, that there's no point in using those uh, qualifiers, but I'm wondering whether they are not, uh, to use the Achleas term, whether they are not obscuring uh, something. So obviously the term that, uh, that uh, interests me most at this point is uh, a religious form of life versus a secular form of life. Can we distinguish those? What does it mean to distinguish those? What does it mean to recognize a form of life as religious? And I want to call attention to the uh, amazing linguistic and anthropological, as it were, uh, work that Talal does with the word cruel, right? With cruelty. What is it that qualifies as cruelty? What is it that doesn't qualify as cruelty? So think of the adjective religious and then think of the adjective cruel, a cruel form of life, yes? And what qualifies as cruel? Again, um, right, a cruel way of killing, as we know, beheading is cruel, but carpet bombing is not cruel. It's just, you know, bombing. Um, a, a drone assassination is not cruel. It might be violent, but it is not cruel. Um, uh, but again, beheading is cruel, yes? Um, um, at the same time, of course, cruelty is something that may be ascri ascribed to, uh, to, in fact, an illness, a cruel illness. And some illnesses are cruel, others are not, which is why we respond to some illnesses, but not to uh, others. Um, so, the, uh, um, and uh, uh, another example in the paper, which I think is, is just uh, uh, amazing, is uh, uh, what happens to the word labor, right? The word labor, what qualifies? fires labor, what Marx taught, taught us about labor, but what, what is uh, and is not a labor. And so those examples are uh, of, of scrutiny, of, of linguistic, philosophical, and anthropological scrutiny as to what the language does, the form of life that it refers us to, uh, is something that uh, um, seems to me to apply, something that I would want to apply repeatedly to the use of the word religious. And again, we treat Islam as a religion. And far from me to say Islam is not a religion, but I do want to ask a grammatical question, I love it, Kenstein, right? What kind of articulation of Islam takes place as we uh, call it religious? And Talal uh, uh, at some point says, one may have to, uh, um, and I'm reading from my page 15, I don't know if we have the same pagination, but one may have to redescribe a form of life in another way than the one generally familiar to us. And so you'll see how I'm coming back to the question of translation. What does it mean? What would it mean to redescribe Islam, a form of life, many forms of life, of life, um, in another way than the one generally familiar to us? Right? Let's not describe it as we are familiar, as a religion, but let's describe it otherwise, right? Descriptions, as Talal reminds us, are instruments for particular use. So what kind of use is operative as we think about Islam um, as a religion? Um, I suppose another way to ask the question, uh, um, uh, and I conclude with this, is that in the distinction between the rationalist and the traditionalist, something like abstraction um, uh, um, preoccupies you, Talal. Um, the kind of abstraction um, from the text whereby one must uh, interpret the text rather than live it, rather than uh, um, um, embody it, right? Rather than um, uh, live one's life according to it. And the, that distinction between the traditionalist, which in a way, I think you affirm the term traditionalist, not in order to reinscribe the old orientalist uh, um, uh, meaning, but rather to actually make it work with the, the way you have been using the, the, the term tradition and discursive tradition, namely as an embodied um, uh, form of life, right? Uh, which is in fact a learning, right? Learning across generation, uh, learning a life across generation. So my question is, as we think of the rationalists, do we think of them as only in fact, kind of scholars who live in the mind and are concerned with 
the, the, the reading and the interpreting of words, um, as opposed to the traditionalist who in fact embody a form of life? Or should we ask rather, what form of life is the rationalist interpretation? What, what kind of life does the uh, uh, rationalist understanding of the text that the text must be understood, for example, as metaphorical, um, as opposed to the traditional traditionalist who say it's not a question of interpretation, it's a question of embodiment, which of course doesn't mean that they don't interpret. They are, of course, interpretations. No one said that the text is not sometimes opaque, but but that what the text calls upon us to do is to learn life from it rather than to learn how to read it, to, to, uh, to stop, as it were, at interpretation. Um, so <laughs> I don't know that it's necessarily productive to, to, um, um, to locate the, the question between the rationalist and the tradi traditionalist in terms of Gil, Gil, a, a I form have, of life. Uh, Gil, I have a yes. lot of questions here in the chat box. All right, I, have, I'm, I'm done actually. Have less than an hour uh, I don't know that it's necessarily useful, but, uh, um, but I, I, I want to ask if tradition is learning and learning is a form of life, what does it mean to qualify one as traditionalist versus rationalist, religious versus secular? And I'll stop at this, thank you. Thank Sorry you for much. being too long. No, 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 that's fine. Talat? Yeah, well, um... There are a number of things that, that uh, Gil, you, you've raised, uh, some of which I'm familiar with and some are new. So I'll just pick up some of the things that you've, you've just asked. And I think that, that abstraction is one particular way of looking at it, uh, as well as the distinction between uh, a description uh, and a, a moral attitude, as it were. I mean, I think nowadays, which I, I believe I tried, tried to think about, but not adequately in the paper. Um, the concern with <clears throat> morality nowadays, or what one might call secular, again, one uses these terms because they are handy and because we know what they mean. In other circumstances, really, there's no point in making that kind of distinction, uh, sharp distinction between one and the other. Uh, and as I, uh, now I'm, wandering towards the end of the paper where I talk about Laurie Branch's excellent book, where I show that some things which were really not thought of as being religious at all become religious. And there is an argument then uh, between those who are religious or see themselves as religious, those who see themselves as not religious in a purely descriptive sense, who are worried by the suggestion of this shift not, which is not a shift simply of, of, uh, of an intellectual kind, but of an actual practical kind too. Uh, if you begin to think of prayer in a very different way and practice prayer in a very different way, you can see why some people are worried by this, uh, of, who, who, are, who belong to, as it were, if one might use that term, an older tradition, uh, and those who have moved to a newer situation where they think that this is absolutely not only valid, uh, but important to stress for, for a number of reasons which they can. And this is part of the sort of, of the, of the, um, the conversation uh, of, of the dialogue, which I think uh, what, what Alistair McIntyre would call living tradition uh, has and should have. And that is a, uh, uh, the ability to be able to continue uh, dialoguing as, as well as arguing uh, with other people as to whether descriptions are, are always necessarily separate from, from uh, moral attitudes and actions, uh, whether the secular is always and, and in every situation distinct from uh, the religious and so on. It's precisely the malleability of these concepts in different, which is what, what uh, Wittgenstein, I think, uh, is concerned with that makes makes them so uh, uh, useful, in fact, to be able to point to something which otherwise you couldn't do. Uh, and that too, I would say, uh, at, at least from my reading of Wittgenstein, I get uh, the sense that um, a form of life is not necessarily 
I was going to say is not at all, but it's not, that's not so either, uh, is not necessarily what anthropologists think of as a total culture. A form of life is something that is seen as distinctive of a way that human beings live. And that may be a particular aspect, a particular moment, a particular kind of behavior or, or word or uh, discourse or, or not. In other words, one has to be sufficiently, I mean, the term is, I think, uh, sufficiently labile for it to be useful precisely because of that. And that's partly why I think the old question of, uh, you know, incommensurability and inside and outside is, is much more problematic than many people who already have entrenched opinions uh, think. And I would not say that uh, certainly that, you know, you can always recognize what is secular from what is religious. And that's why I have some disagreement with some friends whom I admire very much uh, and whom I, whose scholarship I respect very much, uh, Muslims in, in the modern world, who argue that there is a kind of Islamic secularism uh, which, is, um, which refers to the world as it is and which is neither haram nor halal. And I think that that, that really muddies waters too much, uh, but that's another, uh, another story here. So I, I would suggest that, yes, um, these terms, including form of life, can sometimes refer to a total way of living, including the kind of abstraction that people who, who call themselves scientists and, and or call themselves experts in, in whatever field uh, think it is so basic to absolutely everything. And the fact that sometimes, yes, sometimes abstraction is necessary in certain contexts. Uh, sometimes uh, certain terms do overlap uh, and that's what makes possible new senses. Uh, and new meanings uh, of our language, according to, uh, rightly, I think, according to Wittgenstein. And the trouble with, we've had this discussion before about science and so, and so on, is not, you have, you have nowadays, unfortunately, um, foisted onward uh, the, the uh, absolute distinction between those who are for science and those who are against it. And let's leave out our, our dear president the orange man uh, for the moment uh, aside, but, uh, but I think it's not helpful uh, to talk about that. It is, and certainly it wasn't for Wittgenstein, uh, since he was, as I say in the paper, very respectful uh, of the achievements of what one might call uh, a science. But it's the claim to a certain authority. And ironically, this is precisely a caricature of what some secularists think religion is. You suspend your reason and you simply accept something. If somebody says, science says this, then that's what it is. And I try to suggest that, uh, of course, you know, our, our life is absolutely uh, conditioned in ways both good and bad uh, by various kinds of scientific enterprises, uh, that it isn't a single, uh, there isn't a single enterprise. Uh, and it's only, it, or rather it is dangerous when it is a single enterprise and as a claim to authority. When I say science says this, then everybody shut up and, and do exactly what, what I'm saying because I'm speaking for science. That, that's the only sense in which uh, I, I think uh, one must question, which, which may also lead one to recognize that yes, some of us live lives which are doused in, in ideology of, of that kind. And this is one of the first things I think that Marx himself was, was uh, constantly trying to get at. Uh, and, and that is whether it's the notion of alienation, whether it's the notion of, of, of uh, ideological non-recognition of, of what your interests are, which are not simply uh, purely monetary and so on. Uh, that, 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 that this is the kind of life we lead. Uh, and indeed, the kind of life we lead is, as you point out with regard to, to plastics and so on, so saturated with conditions that make 
what one thinks of, what I think of as di a discursive tradition, more and more difficult. Uh, and it may make certain kinds of things easier, but other things more difficult. Uh, and that is something one should at the very least be aware of uh, if that's what one uh, is faced with. So uh, there's, there's much in what you say, of course, that, that we have over time um, discussed and where I have learned from you uh, various things, including what I'm saying. Yes, Mahmoud, I'm about to shut up. Uh, Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dilal. Yes. I, 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 what's, I important, to... what's important is, is, is time and everybody having a fair share. And I agree exactly. with that. Exactly. Yes. So I, I want to move on to uh, a comments or questions from uh, uh, Joseph Miser. Uh, and uh, I, will, I will recognize... Oh. Uh, I will recognize two two sets of people. So we'll go in a gr sort of a round of three questions each. Okay. So the first Sorry. round, the, the first three uh, questions from uh, from uh, Dr. Sara Sali, and the second one from uh, Yosef uh, Jambori, and the third one from Adventino Banjo. Uh, Dr. Sali. I can't. Where is he? <laughs> He's gone She's home. There. She's there. She's there. Oh, yes. oh, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Yes. 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 Hello. My, Hello. My question was around. Okay. Okay. So my question is around the fact that I've just, today was my first introduction to Wegenstein. So I was just wondering then, depending, according to the way you presented the matter, does it mean, I mean, I have two, I had two sets of questions. One, whether the use of the concepts themselves, traditionalists, rationalists, and the rest, are not a contradiction to Wittgenstein, because they tend to impose structures and boundaries around a particular language and how it is used. Then the other ones, what I picked from your paper, and I've, I had the two presenters also refer to it, the mere fact that we don't have definitions. So if we cannot define, how do we begin making sense of reality when we don't have definitions? And if we are to come up with definitions or delineating scope, the scope, how do we go about doing that? And then the third one was, if I am to start from that point of determining how I'm going to proceed on a matter, isn't that in itself being deductive instead of inductive as you articulate in your paper? Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, Yosef? I'm sorry, I missed, may I ask just for the very last point that you made, the very last point, I missed that. Uh, uh, Sarah, may I ask you to repeat the very last point. Oh, the, the very last point was if normally when we write, we begin by making sense and it, determining the boundaries of what we are going to engage with, determining its scope, determining its understanding and how we proceed. But if we do continue doing so, don't we then become guilty of what you called in your papers being deductive other than being open and appreciating a way of life as it is? Thank Hi. you. We go to yourself. Thank you, Professor. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Talal Asad. Uh, I have a question which uh, we have been discussing about and more like a, a clarification than a question. So um, how do we think beyond theory versus practice, a religious scholar versus an ordinary believer, abstraction versus form of life, rationalism versus traditionalism. How do we think beyond these binaries uh, when we think of religion? So uh, how do we think of religious scholars? Uh, very erudite, rational, uh, religious teachers. Are they practitioners or theoreticians of religion. How do we think beyond these binaries? Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Um, Argentino? Uh, 
Yes, thank you, Professor, for the paper. My question is how you think the relationship between persuasion and conversion? Yeah, thank you. Talal, I think we'll, uh, we'll give you a chance to, to engage with these. Uh, okay, well, yes. Um, the first, Longo, which had a number of different um, points that were made. I'm trying to find my notes here. Um, I think if I understood, uh, understood you rightly, uh, Sarah, um, I was not myself, first of all, I think for Wittgenstein, uh, distinctions are not taboo. Uh, and certainly in certain circumstances, it's important to make certain distinctions, even of a binary kind. And you know, there's been a, uh, as you must be familiar, or most of you, uh, a long discussion uh, going back several decades now about how dreadful uh, binaries are and we must all be against binaries, which is again a kind of an absolute which certainly Wittgenstein would not have, have been in favor of, and I certainly am not in favor of that. There are certain situations when it makes good sense to say, you know, uh, I'm sorry, you are a liar uh, and I don't trust your, your, your evidence or whatever. Uh, in other cases, yes, I do believe your evidence, or it's now night and Uh, we seem to have frozen. What I'm going to do is to allow the others who have requested an opportunity to, uh, to ask questions, to actually make uh, comments. Um, and when Professor Asad can hear and communicate uh, through this internet, then we'll, we'll turn to him. Um, I was about to ask, is that okay? But I think you've all been muted. Uh, but but if you have other suggestions, you can you can send them through the chat function. Um, so let's let me continue the list. Uh, uh, Professor Abdul Qadir from from UCT, would you like to uh, would you like to make a comment, please? Let's go next on the list, uh, uh, which is uh, Senoga Hamudan from Miser. Senoga? Yes, um, my question is, um, I would seek clarity on um, the question of what is uh, Professor Talal's perspective on the concept of evil and injustice in respect to God in Islam? I ask this because on page 22 to 23, he discusses some of the 99 names of God, in which he seems to suggest that injustice and evil are not terms attributable to God because the language of the Quran is different from the language of man. So I see clarity on that. Okay, Juliet. Can Juliet hear me? No. Uh, Dixon, Kamakuria. Benedict, Poritzan. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for organizing this and putting this together. I appreciate all the work you put into this. Reading the paper, I had one issue with uh, a notion which creeps up again and again in the paper, the so-called ensouled body. And I wonder what Talal Asad understands using this term and what he makes out of it regarding that he is also says that a self is only becoming a self 
by living a form of life or being within a discursive tradition. So is the ensouled body something which is outside or before, or how can we understand an ensouled body then? Thank you. So Benedict, may I request that uh, you put the question on chat and, and the same request to, uh, uh, to, the, to the others who have asked questions after this uh, break in internet communication with our speaker. Uh, so if you put it on chat, I have a feeling that he's, he's going to be able to see it. Um, so you can, you can put it to everyone or you can put it to him specifically, Dalal Asad, I think. Um, Justin, Bachi Binga. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. Um, my question actually is a simple one. Um, in the paper, there was some discussion about the universality of science. And uh, given uh, our circumstances here where uh, natural and physical sciences are being uh, emphasized over other sciences, can you shed some uh, uh, clarification on this concept of science? Um, is uh, science really restricted to na nature or physical matters, or is it a form of a uh, method? So because some people conceive it as a form of method. Thank you very much. Uh, Gil, are you there? Ta one second, Talal. Yes, I am here. I'm, I'm actually speaking with Talal on the phone, trying to figure out the uh, internet. Okay. Okay. Um, because I thought that uh, uh, you could maybe, if Talal still cannot uh, hear us or be well, heard. Let, give, me, give me two minutes and then I, I'll get back. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll use this opportunity to, to, to say a couple of things. Um, I think a number of questions are, uh, are rotating around a few core issues. Uh, one core issue is, uh, is the relationship between uh, uh, life and thought between uh, practice and, and theory. Uh, and as I heard these questions, I actually thought of uh, how the question was formulated by Marx in his uh, thesis on Feuerbach. Uh, philosophers have tried to understand the world. The point, however, is to change it. Um, and I wondered whether uh, this opposition between life and practice uh, is the main intention of Talal's text or whether his intention is different, which is to, to get us to think of the relationship between life and practice, uh, rather than to get us to think of uh, uh, what is kind of, what, what, is, what is primary. And if we think of the relationship between life and practice, then it seems to me that uh, uh, there's a second question which arises from it, which is a question about different kinds of practices, a, a question internal to practice, a, and, and a question about different kinds of learning, um, a, 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 a question internal to learning itself. The, the Altaimiya uh, text that, uh, that Professor Asad quotes from uh, seems to be stressing this relationship. Uh, uh, b between life and practice rather than giving primacy to one or the other. That was one comment that I had, really kind of question comment. So Talal is back. Um, uh, oh, he, great. He should be, uh, yeah. Talal, I don't know what, winder, what wonders Gil did, but please welcome back. <laughs> uh, there has been much discussion behind your back. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> But please, please continue with 
with whatever notes you have, and then I will, uh, I will try and cover the ground. Well, I'm not sure now where I had reached to, but I would simply say, um, again, with, with, with regard to, uh, was it uh, uh, Yusuf? Well, you were saying, you were saying that yeah. binaries. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're talking about well, binaries. In a sense, this, I can see that that might also be relevant for what uh, Yusuf has asked um, as to how one would describe. You know, there is no a priori way of asking in general, uh, you know, uh, out of the blue, how would you describe uh, those uh, you know, sort of religious scholars and so forth. Obviously, they are not unsophisticated people, that we know. And obviously, they are using reasoning uh, in different ways. And obviously, they are, in, in their own way, very, uh, very uh, uh, obedient Muslims, and they say their prayers, and they, and they do absolutely everything which is supposed to be done ritually, and so on and so forth. I have no doubt about that. And there is no need for assuming that that's a problem, uh, as far as Wittgenstein is concerned, and certainly as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it's, it's insofar as you are asking intellectual questions in an intellectual seminar, uh, we should not be worried about the fact that we are resorting to another intellectual called Wittgenstein uh, to help us think through certain things, even if we don't agree with everything he says, even if we uh, have to uh, turn to other people. After all, the whole history of Islamic thought is also linked with, very importantly, uh, linked with, based on, uh, you know, early Greek, Aristotelian, even Platonic uh, uh, philosophy and so forth. So there's nothing, nothing strange about that. Uh, and certainly Wittgenstein would not say uh, it was strange. We, whether that is uh, a way of life or not, uh, I've suggested, I think Wittgenstein would, would uh, si use it uh, situationally uh, and say that in certain circumstances it, it may be, but uh, if it is a way of what he calls our, our um, not, the word is not our obsession with, but our craving for generality, uh, this is the way, I can't remember now what the German is, but the, the interesting thing is that, of course, a craving is, you know, like, like an alcoholic. Uh, it, it's some kind of a pathology. So he's suggesting not that any kind of generalization under any circumstances uh, is totally verboten uh, and can never be used uh, in his philosophy, uh, but simply that uh, having a craving for and thinking that that is the answer to everything uh, or the most important questions that emerge uh, is a mistake. It's like uh, the alcoholic who feels that if only he had another bottle of whiskey to drink, since that the world would be okay again. And of course, it's not going to be okay. It's going to be even worse. So um, how would one describe uh, a, a religious scholar, a, a religious Islamic scholar? Depends on which scholar one is concerned with. Uh, I know of people who have been dismissed as not, not real scholars at all, uh, and simply somebody who, who uh, is concerned to reconcile uh, modernity with, with Islamic thought and so on. Um, uh, you know, and, and others have, have argued, no, no, this is a very important part of, of, of the development of, of, of Islamic uh, tradition uh, and very relevant for its uh, survival as well as its, its flourishing. So these arguments go on, uh, and, and absolutely no question that there is a final answer, and you certainly won't get that from me, uh, a final answer to the question, how should one describe A, B, and C? Uh, it depends on who A, B, and C are, what are purposes for the description. Uh, I've said at one point, I think in the paper too, which uh, uh, Gil brought up again, uh, that in some very important sense, uh, Description is presupposed, uh, if not absolutely necessary always, uh, and expl made explicit in various kinds of, of uh, uh, moral judgments uh, that we make, uh, both about individuals and about society. So really the answer is to explore these differences, to see what their consequences might be, what their implications are, uh, and whether 
the contradictions are as important as they seem at first sight, uh, how they are dealt with by people. Here, when is doing a kind of descriptive work, um, and whether that is acceptable to people who are members of that tradition or not. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for, uh, for the moment with, with regard to sure. um, the, some of the things, interesting questions that have been raised uh, by the last few speakers. Uh, Bilal, may I, may I uh, yes. interject here with, with, a, with a comment? Um, I, I would like us to go back to your book, uh, Genealogies of Religion. Uh, and, and I wonder uh, where, 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 where you talk about, um, and if that's my understanding of it, where you talk about the, uh, the export of a particular notion of a religion uh, in the 18th century, a global export of a particular notion of religion. And, and I wonder if uh, uh, thinking of religion through Wittgenstein, uh, you are in some ways asking us to rethink the meaning of religion prior to this uh, period of modernism, um, religion as a, as, a, as, a, as a way of life. Uh, rather than religion as an institutionalized sphere, a particular domain, a set of practices, uh, uh, rituals, etc., uh, but but religion as far as, as something that permeates life, um, not not necessarily sustaining the division between ritual and thought, uh, but but kind of doing away with the division in in. Uh, or, or, or at least blurring it very significantly, uh, rather than doing away with it. But I, I wonder if you can take us uh, uh, through that, the reasoning in that book, and and how it relates to what you're saying today. Well, I haven't read that book, you know, since I, I wrote it, so I'm not absolutely sure that I'm accurate about it now. But anyway, I would uh, yes, I would like us to think about what it might mean, not as, as the true definition of religion, uh, but indeed as the point at which people have argued. Uh, the word is much less import important than everything that is demanded, everything that is presupposed, uh, and the reactions people have, the attitudes they have uh, towards what we might otherwise call simply religion. Uh, I'm not concerned with providing a, a more adequate uh, distinction. Uh, I, I am more interested in that kind of, of life, which would also be, I think, uh, a religious and an Islamic uh, life, uh, and one which is made much more difficult now uh, in the world because of the way in which it is. And, and uh, Gill has given a much more graphic uh, example of this, uh, but there have been many others uh, that have been uh, discussed with regard to the way in which modernity has brought us to where it is, with all the wondrous things that it is able to do, not least of them being Zoom, uh, but although I am ambivalent about that too. But uh, the, the fact that it has, you know, that the science is simply something there which is to do with truth uh, and something again to be separated from technology, which of course is, I would argue is, and as together with other people is something which is totally unacceptable if one looks at the history and practice of science. Uh, and to that extent, uh, I would say that, yes, I would like to, us to think about what the kind of life was and not simply something that was less progressive. Because one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I join with others in saying is that one of our biggest ideologies is that of, of progress uh, and of material progress particularly, as well as moral progress, I think. Therefore, what we've left behind is really something which is deserved to be left behind. And I think that that's, that's very questionable. And there's no point in my simply standing and saying, uh, no, I don't believe that. Uh, I'm concerned also with what it is that leads people to believe this uh, and accept it as, as, as a plausible attitude in our time uh, and other attitudes is not any longer plausible uh, and therefore uh, 
uh, I, while I accept with all the pluses and minuses, and uh, I have no option but to do that, that's a silly way of saying I accept, but anyway, uh, where we are at. Uh, but I am at the same time very critical uh, of this notion that what, has, what is past uh, is something that can be left behind, and indeed that it's, it is uh, past. And there I think I, I uh, learn from and I agree with my friend Gill that uh, the, the notion that history is something of the past that happened in the past is of course quite wrong because it includes an attitude to what is and what isn't relevant to us today. Uh, and I would suggest that we think a little more critically about it. But whether we are, whether we are capable of that now any longer, uh, I don't know really. Um, Talal, I know that you have to leave at 11 o'clock, so uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, uh, if, if you agree, have a last round of uh, comments or questions yes. here. And I'm going to recognize four people, which are the last four on our list. And I would request uh, each of you to limit yourself maximum to two minutes and ask one question or one comment, not two or three or four. Um, so we'll begin with uh, Everest Gavirano, uh, then go to um, uh, Ede Bangerezako, uh, then Aslam Farouk, and then uh, Andrea Castella. Everest, please go ahead. Gone home. Well, I don't know. The response time seems to... Uh, okay, while we wait for Everest, uh, uh, Ede Bangerezako, Ede, please, please come on. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Assad, um, for an interesting paper and presentation. Um, you talk about a system that's of statements and attitude which um, traps us, traps, traps us in terms of how we can think out of this uh, system. So you talk about this system that limits how we can um, um, reason or ex express ourselves. And you tell us that a way out of this is, to, is in terms of ambiguity in language. Could you explain more about that? Thank you. Um, Aslam, Farouk. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mamdani, Professor Asad. I, I'm just uh, reflecting a bit on Ray Monk's uh, really exquisite account on Wittgenstein's life. And the picture that's painted uh, in this biography is one of a, uh, a person that's really tormented uh, with, uh, with issues of moral, uh, uh, you know, uh, moral action. So I'm just wondering whether, you know, he saw religion more as uh, uh, embodied practice of a, a moral ethical worldview rather than something to be speculated about. Uh, the account that uh, Monk really gives is, uh, you know, a person that was uh, probably opposed to, to, to speculating, philosophizing about religion. So I'm just wondering what uh, Professor uh, Asad makes of that. Thank you. And uh, Andrea Castella. Um, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for the intervention, Professor Asad. Um, just about a quick question that follows up a little bit what uh, Jill Anijar said, I think. Uh, I was interested in uh, if you could expand a little bit more, what could be the relate, how do you see the relation, in fact, between tra transla translation and persuadability? I mean, if persuadability might be re related to a form of life, it might also be very much related to translation. And so translation is expanding formal life, rather than what a radio formal life kind of presupposes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Talal? Yeah, uh, can I just go back uh, backwards, as it were? Um, indeed, persuadability, uh, I think, is related, obviously, to uh, translation. Uh, and in, it begins, I think, with the very fact that if there is an attempt at persuading, then we are using language and engaging with somebody else in language uh, and through language, trying to get him or her sh to shift uh, their, their position. 
sufficiently. And somebody had mentioned, but anyway, that reminded me of, of conversion versus persuadability. Um, <clears throat> but uh, translation is again something that I think occurs much more pervasively, as as Gill has has also uh, argued for some time uh, in life, and not only in a very explicit sense. Though I would, on the whole, say that it has less to do with that which constitutes uh, what I call the dissolution of science. This is not a term that Wittgenstein himself used, but which I, I've, I've used. And that is when something becomes part of one's uh, form of life, a part of, of the way in which one is what one is uh, and does so uh, automatically, though I want to stress that this doesn't mean to say it's a mechanical thing at all, but, but, but uh, includes what we have sometimes separated out as, as emotion and passion and so on. Uh, so that is, that is certainly something which I think is important, but to the extent that we're concerned with, with reasoning and arguing uh, and asking questions and replying to questions as we are doing here, then translation is absolutely central to it and occurs in all sorts of, of ways. But much of ordinary life, and this is something that seemed to me to be, seems to me to be very important uh, in Wittgenstein's works that I certainly got, uh, and that is sometimes underestimated, is the distinction between the, the reading, the understanding uh, of words and language and so on, and the dissolution of, of words and signs into actually living. Uh, and one knows of people, uh, certainly I've known people uh, who, who have practiced, if I might use that word, their, their religion or their Islam, uh, without articulating it uh, and simply living it. Uh, and to the extent that they do that, then I think signs and even the question of translation doesn't come in. And that's interesting, what happens to them? And indeed, uh, many uh, people who are, uh, who are uh, academics are concerned to find a way of reading that situation as a, a collection of signs. And I think that that's a mistake. Uh, that misses something very important to immediately translate what people do in, in their ordinary life, in their religious life, in their whatever, uh, uh, all sorts of, of, of situations as something that can be read in a certain way. And I think that that's very problematic, uh, although it may be a rather intriguing thing to do. So that's, that's uh, I, I, would, I would agree that, that these two things are, are absolutely important. And uh, whoever it was, uh, the gentleman was this, uh, was this uh, Aslam who's talked about uh, Ray Monks? That's right. Yes, it was you, was it? Yes, yes, uh, which is actually a splendid biography, I must say, uh, I think, uh, terribly long, longer than most books I now read, but uh, nevertheless well worth it if anybody is interested in, in Wittgenstein and, just, and doesn't know anything about him. I would suggest that you do that. I think this is so, and many people have noted that, including some of his friends, um, uh, that in fact Wittgenstein had a very strong moral ethical demand on himself, first of all, uh, and then the notion of him being tormented is very true, uh, and, and this is one aspect of that kind of, of torment. So he was able to make demands, or not able to, but he did make demands on himself of an, an ethical kind. Uh, and he did see that as in some sense uh, essential to what many people were talking about or living as religion uh, uh, to be expressed either in English or in German as he, as he grew up. Because he was of course born and brought up uh, as a Catholic, uh, but uh, was not, as I said, in any uh, obvious, um, conventional sense, religious. He didn't go to church and so on. Uh, so yes, that's the, I think it was absolutely central uh, to him. Um, the, the, the other point was about ambiguity and so on. And I think that, I think that 
yes, that this is important, but not only, um, and I forget, you will forgive me if I, I've forgotten your name, but because I don't see everybody's name here. It's, it's Ede. I'm Ede. 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 Yes. Ede? Yes. Ede. Yeah. Ede. Ede. I see Ede. Yes, uh, because I see other people uh, either as names uh, or as photographs, but uh, Mahmoud and I are somehow presented as, as people constantly uh, wagging their <laughs> heads up and down. Um, yes, you talked about getting out of a certain way of thinking. Yes, I think that it's an advantage uh, to, to look at language much more as, as ambiguity. You know, there's a very famous, for those of you who don't already know, uh, this uh, about Wittgenstein and know enough about Wittgenstein. He made a very famous um, image of language uh, not as a calculus, uh, which he had originally uh, used it and treated it as, but as he said, like, like an ancient city with different parts which have been built at different times and which are, which are being rebuilt and, and, and uh, broken down and, and some with straight avenues, some with twisted ones, uh, and so on, and inhabit it in certain ways, and incomplete, always incomplete, language is always incomplete, that the possibilities of language, uh, the various things you can do with it, and the various things you can't do with it, uh, are incomplete. Uh, and I'm not sure, to go directly to the question, that simply thinking in different ways is going to be enough uh, for, for our predicament now, uh, that, but that's simply um, you know, uh, an old man talking who ob obviously doesn't have to be paid attention to. I, I think that we've gone too far uh, uh, along that road and we would have to change and how we change the way we live is becoming increasingly, increasingly difficult, if not impossible, uh, given the kind of world that we have created for ourselves uh, in all sorts of ways, well-meaning as, well as, as well as meaning in a malign way. So. Yes, we could do interesting things by pursuing ambiguity uh, and looking at the way in which language can extend itself through ambiguity and new senses uh, can develop both to obscure uh, and to make, make possible new kinds of senses and obscure old kinds of senses. But I don't think that that's going to be um, all that important for where we are at for reasons that uh, even Gill has already indicated about, uh, uh, about our uh, uh, plastic world. There we are. I, I'm, I don't know whether this is, this is adequate, but that's about as much as I can do, I'm afraid at the moment. So um, I leave it to you to think more clearly uh, at greater length and not just to remain at the level of thought, uh, but at the level how, of how one lives. And all the great teachers have in fact been stressing that in the past. Uh, I can think, I mean, the religious teachers too, whether they are Chinese or Indian or, or, or Islamic or, or Christian or Jewish, uh, they've all stressed that it's the way you live that is important, apropos what, what Mahmoud uh, has asked specifically, rather than just what you think. So Mahmoud, there we are. Here we are with your help. Um, well, there we are. Well, I want to, uh, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank uh, Professor Assad for this extraordinary generosity uh, at a difficult time when uh, uh, most of us, if not all of us, are, are becoming uh, a fatigue, the Zoom fatigue. Uh, is building into us. Most of our communicative life is is now being channeled through Zoom. Um, and uh, in spite of all this, uh, you've you've taken a couple of hours to devote to this conversation. I also want to say to you that uh, for especially the community at Miser, uh, it's been an extraordinary opportunity. Um, to 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 engage with you, to learn from you, and particularly to get a sense of the uh, the way you think and the way you resist uh, easy conclusions. 
um, and the way you resist conclusions um, and the way you refuse to just uh, turn around and look at what you've done uh, but uh, continue to do. Um, we look forward to reading more and more. Uh, next week, next Wednesday, we will be uh, having a presentation by Gayatri Spivak. Um, Gayatri is going to speak on subalternative. Uh, the, the readings for next Wednesday uh, are there on the MISER website. So if you go to the MISER website and if you don't know it, just send a note to uh, the communications person, the person who wrote to you, inviting you to this seminar. Uh, Javi, uh, Javi is his name. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much once again, Talal, and uh, thank thanks you. everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you to everybody, because there you've said various things which have set me thinking uh, again, and I will think about uh, which I wasn't able to respond adequately to, and I will certainly I found it a useful and helpful uh, conversation. Thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm going to uh, close this meeting um, unless somebody has a tremendous urge to give a final word, but nobody does. So I think, Javi, Javi, you can close the meeting, please. <laughs>